Our culture tells us that science and faith are in conflict, but there's no conflict between faith and physics or chemistry or even most of biology. The only corner of science that's in conflict with faith is evolution. There's a good reason for this conflict. Evolution has claimed that life is just an accident and that science has proven that an unguided physical process can account for biological complexity. These quotes made that point. Man has to understand that he is a mere accident. Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. This isn't an idea Christians can simply dismiss. When Darwinists assert that life is just an accident and that science supports that conclusion, it's fair to demand irrefutable scientific evidence. Claiming that science supports your position isn't the same as proving exactly how science supports your position. Actually, current science is revealing a creator in ways previous generations could never have imagined. We see the necessity of a designer in the molecular machines that animate cells, in the information in DNA, in the irreducible complexity of the Krebs cycle, and in the functional coherence of all living things. Many leading scientists still cling to the Darwinian paradigm, but only because of intellectual inertia. The scientific facts now refute Darwinism and support intelligent design. We introduced you to some of those facts through the core insights from intelligent design. Number one, life's foundation is information. Two, life is irreducibly complex. Three, life is functionally coherent. Four, the universe is fine-tuned for life. And five, mutations never create new genes. They degrade or break existing genes. Session one introduced Darwinism and intelligent design. Before Darwin, almost everyone understood that nature required a designer, a creator. Then Darwin offered the world design without a designer, and in a leap of faith, the world bought it. Science knew very little about biology before the 20th century. Genetics and the mechanisms of heredity were a mystery. Most scientists accepted Lamarck's theory that organisms could pass on traits they acquired during their lifetime. So blacksmiths were expected to have strong children. Molecular biology didn't exist yet. Based on the limited knowledge of his day, Darwin developed his theory around his mistaken assumptions. Beneficial variations appear reliably. Acquired traits can be passed to offspring. There are no limits to genetic change. Natural selection accumulates beneficial variations. These assumptions led Darwin to the conclusion that all life forms are descended through common ancestry. Darwin's theory made progress seem inevitable, even though he couldn't offer any mechanism that could drive the genetic processes he pictured. Then, between 1930 and 1960, Neo-Darwinism decided that copying errors in DNA could supply that missing mechanism and provide the pathway to the unlimited genetic change their theory needed. Darwinism makes sense in the abstract as armchair philosophy, but when you consider its hidden assumptions in light of modern science, it crumbles. The rest of session one was devoted to three of the core ID insights from molecular biology. First, life is based on information. It takes an enormous amount of information to build the hundreds of thousands of molecular machines inside every cell. You can't get that information by accident. Second, life is irreducibly complex. Until you have all the parts for a molecular machine in place, it doesn't work at all. Natural selection only preserves features that work, so it can't help you develop new abilities that require more than one step. And third, life is functionally coherent. An organism needs all its organs and systems working together. None of those organs can survive if separated from the organism. Getting one component of a new system, then waiting a million years for the next to accidentally appear, doesn't work in the real world. Functional coherence points to the foresight of an intelligent designer. In session two, we saw that science now confirms that the universe had a beginning. Anything that has a beginning must have a cause. 
We also saw that the four fundamental forces of nature are so precisely balanced that if you change one even slightly, most of the elements in the periodic table wouldn't exist. These facts strongly support a designed universe, not an accidental one. Life is an active, purposeful state. Every living cell has to continuously produce the energy it needs to combat entropy and maintain life. Without that steady supply of energy, a cell dies within minutes. Every cell, whether it's an animal, plant, or bacterial cell, obtains its energy from ATP molecules produced in an incredibly complex process called cellular respiration. Most of the cells in our body need to produce over 100,000 new ATP molecules every second just to maintain homeostasis and counteract entropy. Early cells couldn't wait patiently for this to evolve. The energy production process needs a steady supply of oxygen and glucose. This gave us a good opportunity to see the three core insights from molecular biology in action. It takes the coordinated efforts of at least 10 different systems in our bodies just to get oxygen to each cell. It takes your blood vessels, heart, lungs, muscles, brain, bones, blood, and filters all working together you can't live unless all those systems are functioning together perfectly. That's functional coherence. Then the oxygen is used in a complex three-step process that requires at least 15 protein enzymes and five molecular machines. These only exist inside living cells and only because of information that's put to use to manufacture them. They don't occur naturally as a result of simple chemistry. Each of those molecular machines is made from multiple protein parts. They're irreducibly complex. They're useless until all the parts are present and functioning. Darwinists think that energy production in cells could have developed bit by bit, starting with a very simple process. But they never offer any details about how cells could have invented a simpler process one small step at a time. And remember that the number of ways a cell could try, but fail, to produce energy is unlimited. In the real world, Darwinism collapses when you think through the details. We spent Section 3 exploring mutations, micro and macro evolution, and Michael Behe's latest challenge to Darwinism, Darwin devolves. Most people who embrace Darwinian evolution are convinced that it's a proven fact They've been told that mutations produce variations which are captured by natural selection. Darwinists cite observations of adaptation, called microevolution, as proof. Biologists distinguish two varieties of evolution. Microevolution refers to the adaptation observed within or between closely related species. That would be a brown bear adapting to become a polar bear. Macroevolution refers to large-scale changes that evolutionists presume from their theory of common descent. That would be a brown bear morphing into a whale. There are a huge number of genetic differences between bears and whales, and Darwinists need to account for those differences. They're assuming that random mutations will create new genes that code for new proteins. We looked at what random mutations actually do to see if they can measure up to Darwinists' expectations. There are four classes of mutations, substitutions, insertions, deletions, and duplications. A substitution mutation is like a single letter typo. Changing a single nucleotide can't create a completely different gene coding for a new protein. Insertions, deletions, and duplications always produce what's called a frame shift, since DNA letters are read in groups of three. These invariably destroy the gene's meaning. Random mutations can't possibly create novel genes. A brand new gene would require so many specific mutations that it would be mathematically impossible. Next, we looked at the microevolution that textbooks cite in support of macroevolution. The ability to sequence genomes has made it possible to match observed adaptations to specific mutations. Gene sequencing is completely invalidating earlier perceptions about microevolution. Some textbook examples only require reshuffling existing genes, so no mutations are involved. In the examples that do involve mutations, gene sequencing shows 
that the mutations that produce microevolution aren't building new genes. Instead, they're only degrading genes that already existed. If mutations can't be relied on to produce new genes, then the Darwinist narrative falls apart. Michael Behe calls this the first rule of adaptive evolution. Random mutations can far more easily break a gene than enable some new function. So solutions to challenges that involve breaking a gene will predominate. He's paraphrased that as the fastest way to adapt is to give up something or break something. So brown bears can adapt to a polar climate and become polar bears. When you look at their DNA, the adaptations were triggered by a handful of genes that were degraded by mutations. No new genes were produced. But bears and whales are very different animals. Morphing a brown bear into a whale would require thousands of brand new genes and new proteins. No mechanism exists that can generate them. The effect of mutations can be compared to cooking with a fixed list of ingredients. Given this set of ingredients, you can adjust the amounts of each ingredient and make a wide variety of things for dinner. But you can't create any new ingredients. So unless you started with cherries, there is no cherry pie for dessert. Our genomes work the same way. Mutations can change the effectiveness of genes, degrade genes, or eliminate genes, but they don't have any way to create brand new genes. That would require multiple coordinated mutations. Darwinists can't point to any viable pathway to the thousands of new and novel genes that macroevolution would need, and that means that their theory is increasingly obsolete. In session four, we look more closely at the evidence that Darwinists claim upholds their theory. Before Darwin wrote Origin, German biologist Ernst Haeckel had proposed that embryos retrace their evolutionary history, tacking new features onto the end of the development process. He published drawings that appeared to verify his theory. Darwin thought this was his best supporting evidence, but today we know that Haeckel's simplistic theory was wildly wrong and that his drawings were frauds. Unfortunately, Haeckel's concept still appears in textbooks. After Darwin's best evidence, we took our topics from Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True. We divided them into four categories, assumed support, refuted support, logical errors, and just-so stories. Most people assume the fossil record is the most compelling evidence favoring evolution, but it actually contradicts the theory. Bottom-up and top-down processes apply as an organizing principle in many fields. A top-down approach starts with a goal, then develops the details with that goal in mind. A bottom-up approach starts with low-level components, then joins them into an emerging system. Since evolution couldn't have the foresight to establish goals, Darwin envisioned a bottom-up process. He expected new species would appear first, gradually morphing into new families, new orders, then new classes, and eventually new phyla. But the fossil record is the artifact of a top-down process. The biggest mismatch between the bottom-up process Darwin predicted and the top-down process we observe occurs in the Cambrian explosion. Before that time period, life consisted primarily of simple, single-celled organisms and not much else. Then, within a geological eye blink, we find animals with skeletons, brains, binocular vision, muscles, nerves, digestive tracts, blood vessels, and lots more. More than 20 new phyla of fully formed animals suddenly appeared with no fossil precursors. These included body plants as different as fish, aquatic worms, clams, crabs, starfish, and trilobites. None of that validates the bottom-up Darwinian story. Many of the supporting arguments used by Darwinists have already been refuted, but they still appear in articles and textbooks. For years, Darwinists have claimed that most of our genome is just junk, left over from eons of evolution's trial and error. That concept was decisively refuted by the ENCODE project in 2012. Now we know that all or nearly all of our DNA is needed and used. When Darwinists find something they don't consider perfectly designed, they claim it proves that there's no designer. 
Their logic is that a perfect God wouldn't make mistakes, only a blind process like evolution would. We looked at one favorite bad design argument, the claim that our eyes are wired backwards, but we found it was actually an ingenious solution to a problem that isn't immediately obvious. Darwinist perceptions of poor design fall apart as scientists gain a better understanding of the underlying biology and of engineering principles. Just so stories, which Darwinists call plausible scenarios, are abundant in evolution literature. We sampled the origin of hearing, pachycetus to whales, how fish got lungs, and Nilsson and Pelger's evolution of the eye. You can find hundreds more like those. They build a narrative based on how things look, not how they work, then claim it might have happened just this way. It makes for good stories, but that's all they are. Darwinists claim the existence of any plausible scenario proves that there must be some naturalistic pathway to complexity, even if that particular story is later shown to be nonsense. Plausible scenarios serve their purpose because people assume Darwinists can back up the stories with science, but they aren't backed up by any science at all. Many people build their worldviews around the Darwinist creation myth, assuming there is scientific evidence to support it. Stephen Meyer summed it up best, trifling evidence and momentous conclusions. That is evolution in a nutshell. Darwinists are confident that somehow life must have assembled itself, either by a very unlikely freak accident in the distant past or as the result of some physical law or process not yet discovered. In session five, we looked at origin of life research. Evolution begins with an assumed first organism, but in order to replace a creator, evolution also needs to explain the origin of that first organism. If you read the latest headlines about origins research, you'd think that success is just around the corner. Those headlines are blatant exaggerations. Many of us learned in school that scientists had already created life in a test tube in the 1953 Miller and Urey experiment. At the time, scientists still thought that life was based on chemistry, and they only needed to find the just right combination of chemicals that would come to life. Miller's experiment did produce a few amino acids, but they were all simpler than the 20 amino acids used by living organisms. Generating a few of the wrong amino acids falls short of creating life. Yet the Miller-Urey experiment is the high watermark for Origins research. It's still cited in most biology textbooks as if it points the way to life's origin. The building blocks for all living things are cells, so we naturally assume Origins research is looking for some natural process that could have assembled the first cell. That's a challenging problem. When mathematicians face a dawning problem, they use a time-honored technique they call solve a simpler problem. Origins researchers have taken that a step further with adopt a simpler definition. They cut their task down to size by simply redefining life. Here's one of their definitions. Life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Definitions like this represent reductionism the practice of reducing complex systems into their simplest parts and then only considering those parts in isolation. To a reductionist, a watch is just a few gears and springs. Based on reductionist definitions for life, Origins research isn't looking for a cell. Their targets are much simpler. Either a self-reproducing molecule, this is called the genes first approach, or a collection of molecules that can produce energy. This is called the metabolism first approach. By reducing their goals from a cell to a few molecules, they avoid the single most important fact that science has uncovered about life. Life isn't built on chemistry, it's built on information. Currently, the most popular model for the origin of life comes from the genes first approach, and it's called the RNA world hypothesis. When you look at the details in RNA world, their narrative falls apart. And without experimental success, it's only another just-so story. So what success have they had? 
Scientists have been able to design and assemble RNA molecules in their labs, but the process is complex, involves more than 100 separate steps, and it requires a modern lab with constant intervention by technicians who have information and goals. It doesn't happen naturally, and it couldn't have happened on the early Earth. That sounds more like intelligent design than accidental evolution. Dean Kenyon once made headlines like this himself when he authored Biochemical Predestination, but soon after he rejected his own theory. Simple chemicals do not arrange themselves into complex information-bearing molecules, nor do they move in life-relevant directions, unless, that is, biochemists actively and intelligently guide the process. Origins research continues to make headlines like this, as it has for the past 60 years. There's no truth behind the headlines. How do they generate such misleading headlines? Brian Miller, a biophysicist at Discovery Institute, explains, the problem starts with origin of life researchers greatly exaggerating the significance of their results. Then the popular press amplifies the claims to ridiculous extremes. Finally, science textbook publishers canonize the misinformation by embedding it in official curricula. Headlines like this do work to mold public opinion. In a recent survey of nearly 700 respondents, most with college degrees, 72% of them thought Origins Research had already created simple life forms such as bacteria from scratch. But there are no genuine success stories in the Origins field. Researchers can produce a self-replicating molecule, but only with the constant intervention of intelligent technicians and a living cell is far beyond a self-replicating molecule. Origins headlines persuade a lot of people, but they are word games, not science. Session six covered the best known just so story of all, Ape to Man. This story started with Darwin's book, Descent of Man. Based on his theory of descent with modification, Darwin announced that we must have descended from an ancient primate. It's a simple story, endlessly repeated, that has become a cultural certainty. Biologists are now so certain that humans are essentially apes that they've redefined taxonomy to reflect that belief. Linnaeus classified humans in the primate order, but in our own family, which he called hominidae. He placed all the great apes into a different family, which he called pongidae. During the 20th century, biologists eliminated the pongidae family from taxonomy and they moved all the great apes into the hominidae family. So today, the taxonomy looks like this, and we're now part of a big happy family that includes our supposed great ape cousins. And now when paleontologists find an ancient ape fossil, it's classified as part of the family hominidae, and it's called a hominid. By definition, there's no other classification that could fit. If they can also make a case for bipedalism, or a larger brain, they hit the jackpot. Their fossil qualifies as a hominin, a human ancestor. Without Darwin's hypothesis and biologists' reclassification, it's unlikely the so-called hominid fossils they found would have been identified as human ancestors. Darwinists aren't troubled by that circular reasoning. They claim the fossil evidence for human evolution is irrefutable. So, paleontologists look at hominid fossils and see the pre-human clues that they've been trained to see. But if you look at the fossils without that mindset, you'll see a different picture. First, there aren't many fossils, and those that exist are predominantly skulls and teeth. As Stephen Jay Gould said, most hominid fossils, even though they serve as a basis for endless speculation and elaborate storytelling, are fragments of jaws and scraps of skulls. Complete skeletons are never found, and partial skeletons are rare. Second, the fossils that exist don't establish bipedality. The condition of the fossils isn't good enough to let scientists get the measurements that might establish bipedality. Many experts who accept evolution don't find the fossil evidence convincing. All of the Artipithecus ramidus bipedal characters cited also serve the mechanical requisites of quadrupedality. 
I frankly don't think Artie was a hominid or bipedal. There's also no trend among hominid fossils toward increasing cranial capacity. The brain size for all hominids is right in line with modern chimps and gorillas. But that's only one-fifth to one-third the cranial capacity of genus Homo. Hominid fossils strongly resemble gorillas, chimps, and bonobos. This makes many experts skeptical. Anthropologist Adrian Zillman has said Lucy's fossil remains match up remarkably well with the bones of a pygmy chimp. After studying the Tumai skull, paleontology professor Bridget Sinnott called it the skull of a female gorilla. Darwin's assertion that we must have descended from an ancient primate sparked a relentless search for fossils that could prove his theory. After 150 years of fossil hunting, there is a widening discontinuity between what paleontologists have actually found and their interpretation of what they've found. Casey Luskin sums it up for us. The Darwinian belief that humans evolved from ape-like species requires inferences that go beyond the evidence and is not supported by the fossil record. Convincing the public relies on good storytellers and good illustrators. When National Geographic unveils a new hominid ancestor, they do their best to make them look as human as possible. How did these fossils turn into this, but not this? One trick illustrators use to make hominids look human is to give them human eyes. We never see the whites of an animal's eyes. That is a human characteristic, and adding human eyes is way beyond the data available from the fossils. Harvard anthropologist Ernest Houghton said, alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little, if any, scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. Well, it works. Fantastic storytellers and artists do succeed in misleading the public. We're told that we are 96 to 99% genetically similar to chimps, which implies that there's not much difference between us. As one typical headline reads, Charles Darwin was right, and chimp gene map proves it. We went through some of the genetic differences those headlines are leaving out. A more realistic and unbiased evaluation would put the genetic similarity between chimps and humans at 90 to 95 percent. This is actually about the same as human similarity to all other mammals. So next time a headline tells you we're 98 percent similar to chimps, remember that's an exaggeration. Based on genetic similarity alone, we're just as likely to be descended from a kangaroo as we are from a chimp. It's easy to declare that humans are really just bipedal apes with bigger brains, but that ignores the essential differences between humans and apes. Ann Gager stated this well, there are whole realms of intellect and experience that make us unique as humans. Abstract thought, art, music, and language. These things separate us from lower animals fundamentally, not just in degree, but in kind. We are not souped up apes. Our ability for abstract thought and language is unique to humans. Evolution can't explain it. You can teach chimps a rudimentary sign language, but they still have nothing to say. Chimpanzees never have had and never will have history, art, music, literature, mathematics, sports, cooking, or technology. Today, Darwinism is still the reigning creation myth of our time, but the emperor still isn't wearing any clothes. Darwinism is coasting on cultural inertia. It claims the mantle of science, but we have to agree with David Berlinski. Evolution is atheism with scientific pretensions. An increasing number of scientists are reinterpreting scientific discoveries as evidence for amazing design. As science learns more, we can expect this number to grow. In time, culture will catch up. For the past 60 years, science has been confirming the necessity of a creator. From the tiny molecular machines that power cells, to the fine-tuning of the cosmos, from irreducible complexity to functional coherence, science verifies that life isn't the result of any natural process. Life requires foresight, creativity, and wisdom. Life required a miracle. 
We are not an accident cobbled together by the blind forces of nature. And we're blessed to live in a time, the first time in history, when science is confirming that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Today, it's easy to educate yourself, and we recommend the books and DVDs from the people who've been driving intelligent design. Alester Media's Design of Life series is excellent. It includes Metamorphosis, Flight, and Living Waters. For good introductory books, we recommend Darwin on Trial by Philip Johnson, God's Undertaker by John Lennox, Darwin's House of Cards by Tom Bethel, and Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. Then move on to Undeniable by Doug Axe, The Design of Life by William Dembski and Jonathan Wells, Darwin's Black Box and Darwin Devolves by Michael Behe, Children of Light, The Wonder of Water, and The Miracle of the Cell, all by Michael Denton. Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, and The Return of the God Hypothesis by Stephen Meyer.